Well, good morning and welcome to Plains Evangelical Church, Church Online. It's great to have you with us this morning. If you're new to us, you're very welcome. We've been going through Matthew's Gospel, the first book in the Bible, on Sunday mornings. And we're going to continue where we left off last week. So if you've got a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, please get in touch with us. I'll give the email address at the end. We would love to give you one for free um, and have you be able to look at God's word for yourself. In addition to that, there is also apps available uh, from your app store um, and Bibles online. So you'll be able to follow on and see that what I'm saying is not my words, but God's words to us today. So let's just commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it speaks to us. And Lord, we open up our hearts, we open up our lives this morning as we listen to what you have to say to us. God, we pray for this word. We pray that you would give us understanding and Lord, that you would help us know what you uh, want to do in our lives and in our world. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, Matthew chapter 4, and it's the second half of Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through to verse 25. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Now when he, heard, when he heard, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went to live in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. And what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. In the land of Zebulun, in the land of Naphtali, the way by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people in dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called to them, and immediately they left their boat and followed him. And they went throughout all the regions, of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of every kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So fame spread throughout all of Syria and they brought to him the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And, a, and great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea and beyond the Jordan. Well, I wonder what kind of a person do you think of when you think of someone who does ministry? You might connect it to the word minister and deduce that a min ministry is done by somebody who's ordained into the ministry or someone like a missionary or an evangelist. But the Bible says that all Christians are to preach the gospel. And that preaching of the gospel is ministry to unbelievers. It also says that all Christians should teach and encourage one another using the Bible. And so that's ministry to believers. Another thing the Bible teaches is that Christians should carry out what is called mercy ministries. That's practical ministries to those who are in need. So ministry is not something for the few but it's something that all Christians are called to do individually as well as when they come together as the church. Matthew's gospel records the life and ministry of Jesus but as we read it it's not like we're reading a biography of somebody like Billy Graham or someone else who we hold in high regard as a great minister of the gospel. It's an instruction manual to teach us through the perfect example of Jesus the way that we should minister to the needs of others. So chapter 4 in Matthew's Gospel marks the beginning of the three-year ministry of Jesus on earth. So we've seen his birth, we've seen his preparation 
through his cousin John. We've seen the preparation of Jesus himself through his baptism and temptation. And now we begin to see what will be a familiar pattern throughout the book of Matthew and end up at the cross. So let's look at the start of Jesus' ministry to what we can learn for our own lives. And first of all, let's look at his movements. What happens next to Jesus in, in the story ensures that he begins his ministry at the right time and in the right place. The right time, there's a passage in the Bible uh, and it actually inspired a 1970s song by a band called The Birds. Uh, that says there is a time for everything, a season for every activity under the earth. You're singing that song if you know it now, aren't you? Oh well, let's get back to the passage. Everything in the world happens under the sovereign control of God. God has appointed a time when everything should happen. When it comes to Jesus, Galatians 4.4 4 says, When the fullness of time, when the right time had come, God gave his son. Even after Jesus was given to humanity, God was still in control. It was at the right time when he began his ministry. Matthew doesn't record much of the very early ministry of Jesus. What happens between what happens in the wilderness, as we saw last week in our passage today. But you can fill in the blanks by reading John chapter 2 verse 1 to John chapter 5 verse 35. However, by Matthew chapter 4 verse 12, we're told that John the Baptist had been arrested. The precise charges and reasons for why he was arrested, they're unknown. But looking ahead to Jesus' ministry, it's most likely that what happened was the Jewish authorities saw John as a threat as he preached this new message of repentance. Well, it wasn't really a new message, but it was a new message for the day. That arrest inevitably led on to John's execution, as we read later on in Matthew chapter 14. So John's work is now done. He was involuntarily retiring from ministry. And Jesus was the new recruit. It's not uncommon for ordained ministers to come their retirement, hold back on the inevitable and in some cases overstay their time. And it's at times like these where God steps in and forces the hand. Maybe you've noticed that in your own life. You've resisted God's timing and God has had to do something in your life to force your hand. Or maybe like here in Matthew chapter 4, God changes your circumstances so that he can make his timing clear to you. Jesus came into history at the right time. He began his ministry at the right time. He died at the right time in order to bring about salvation. 2 Corinthians verse 6 verse 2 says, Now is the day of salvation. So for us, Jesus' work of salvation is complete. If you haven't done so already, don't wait for the right time. Because the Bible says that the right time is now. Trust him now. Turn to God now. And if you've already done that, trust, the God's, trust in God's timing and not your own. See, we can often get a bit tempted when we're not on control of time. That we get a bit impatient. And it's at times like that where we often fall into sin. Think of the story of Abraham. God promised him a son and he waited and waited. He was getting older and older. He was starting to doubt the plan of God and decided to do things on his own timing. And that's when things went wrong for Abraham. God's ways are perfect, as is God's time. Wait, and when that time comes, act. Jesus' movements also happen to put him in the right place. Again, there are some blanks to fill in uh, between Matthew chapter 4 verse 11 and 4 verse 12. And this time we can do that from Luke's gospel. Matthew tells us that after John was arrested, Jesus went back to his home region of Galilee and his childhood hometown of Nazareth. And it's from here where he moves 30 miles south to the town of Capernaum. And this is his new home. This is his base of operations for his remainder the remainder of his ministry time. But Luke's gospel tells us the reason why Jesus moved from Nazareth to Capernaum. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus stands up and he's 
home church, essentially, the Jewish synagogue. And he reads from the prophet Isaiah, who speaks about the coming Messiah. Jesus puts the scroll down, he looks at the congregation, and he says, that that Isaiah is speaking about, that's me. In their eyes, Jesus was no more than the boy belonging to Joseph and Mary. He was nothing but a carpenter's son. They saw him as nothing special amongst the townspeople. The people were outraged at this. They even took him outside the synagogue and tried to throw him off a cliff. But God rescues Jesus and helps him escape to Capernaum and there he lives his life instead. He is literally driven out of his own hometown. There's only one other record in the Gospels where he did return to Nazareth and there he received a frosty reception also. Jesus the Messiah is often seen as an offensive message to people even today. They don't like someone being in control of their lives. But the truth is that without Jesus as our Messiah, we're not in control. We might think we are, but that's only tested in times of weakness. And if we can somehow manage during times of weakness, the ultimate test comes in death, of which no human has control over. We can choose to choose to throw Jesus off the cliff, or we can choose to accept him and welcome him as our Messiah in our hometown, in our home, in our own lives. But Matthew tells us one other reason for Jesus' move, and it's another fulfilled pro- prophecy from Isaiah. It comes from Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2. It's quoted in Matthew 4 verses 15 and 16. Isaiah records that the Messiah will come not from one of the top rabbi schools in Jerusalem, the Cambridge and Oxford of the day, but from a Gentile, a non-Jewish town. Isaiah is a top textbook and a top rabbi school. Yet, as we see, the Jews are the ones who reject Jesus. Jesus didn't just come for the Jews. Capernaum was strategically placed on a main road that stretched the entire length and breadth of the Roman Empire, what was the known world at the time. Jerusalem was further south, it was more secluded. It was built on a hill with one way in and one way out. Jesus didn't come for one people group, one class, one level of morality. Jesus came for the whole world. That is the message for us today. The fulfilled prophecy should turn our attention to Jesus and lead our turning, lead to turning our hearts towards him. So that's Jesus' movements. What about the message that he spoke? Verse 17. If you've been following the story so far, you'll notice that as you read verse 17, the message is a familiar one. Back at the beginning of Matthew chapter 3, Jesus' predecessor, his cousin John, was preaching this message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. That means to turn your life from walking against God and turn your life walking with God and in his ways. The kingdom of God is the family of God's people. It was once the nation of Israel, and shortly at, then shortly after Jesus returned to heaven, it became the church, which it remains to this day. The church is the collective term that we use for all genuine Christians. When Jesus returns, he'll establish a new kingdom, an eternal kingdom, one that's without sin, one that's without suffering and death. And so, going from John the Baptist to Jesus, the ministers changed, but the message remains the same. This is the great theme of Jesus' teaching throughout the Gospel of Matthew. There are many people in the world today who would argue that the Bible is out of date, therefore it's obsolete. The society and society and culture have somehow outgrown it. But the fact of the matter is the Bible doesn't mould its the, sorry culture doesn't mould itself around the Bible, but rather sorry cult the Bible doesn't mould itself around culture. Culture should mould itself around the Bible. We're living in different times, yes, but that should only change some of the applications of the Bible. 
not its teaching. But one application will never change. And that is the fact that if you are living against God, then you need to repent. You need to turn from a life against God and turn to a life for God through Jesus Christ. Jesus was not only a preacher, he was the Messiah. He was the great rescuer from sin. He paid the price that enabled sinful people to turn from from their own ways and be part of the kingdom of God. So let me ask you, are you part of that kingdom today? And if you are, are you a participator in that kingdom today? The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, it's not something that we'll enjoy after we die. The Bible says that we should live on earth as it is in heaven. We need to participate in kingdom values today. So that's the message. What about the methods? Think about social media. The purpose of social media is to accumulate the biggest num- following of people. According to Google, currently the highest number of likes on Facebook is the footballer Cristiano Ronaldo. He's got 126 million followers. The highest number of followers on Twitter is Barack Obama. He's only got 117 million followers, not as popular. The Bible calls us to be followers of Jesus. And it uses this word, disciples. Many great teachers of the day would have had disciples. We're told that John the Baptist had disciples. In fact, John's gospel records that two of John the Baptist's followers responded to John's revelation of Jesus at his baptism. And at this, they stopped following John and they started following Jesus. Now, this wasn't a popularity contest like unfriending one friend and friending another. This is exactly what John was intending to do with his ministry. So when Jesus started his ministry, he accumulated disciples. But the fact of the matter is, being a true disciple of Jesus, it's more than just pressing a button and obtaining a news feed. Later on in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus gives a definition as to what it means to be a disciple. He says this, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up your cross and follow me. So to deny yourself is what you do when you repent. It's the turning from all the things that you hold dear and the turning towards God and what he desires for your life. And in order to do that, you might have to forsake certain things. But this is what being a true disciple of Jesus requires. The verse says, whoever wants to be my disciple, it must be a desire, a want. And if you believe in the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and want to become a Christian, you need to count the cost of what you are going to have to deny before you make that prayer. And the next bit helps us do that. It says we must take up our cross. When Jesus spoke this to his disciples, they didn't know exactly what it meant. But with hindsight, we do. Jesus is not saying that Christians literally have to die on a cross in order to follow him. But in looking at the example that he set for us on the cross, we can know what denying ourselves looks like. If Jesus willingly went to the cross and died to save other people, putting aside his own feelings, his own desires, then what can be so hard for us to deny today? Romans 12 verse 1 says that just as Jesus offered himself as a death sacrifice, so we should offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. And only once we do that can we follow him. If you are a Christian, then you are a disciple. You are a follower of Christ. Christianity is not a religion that you assign yourself or a church that you attend. Christianity is to have Christ in you that you follow him in every step of your life. He is your sat-nav, and he makes no mistakes. If you follow Christ, you won't accidentally make a wrong turning into a river. In other gospel accounts, we have a list of 12 people that Jesus called. Later on in Matthew, 
Jesus, Matthew looks back and records who are there. We we meet their we see their stories in some of the other gospel accounts. Uh, but Matthew records just four of these twelve men, three of whom would become his closest of friends, one of whom would become his nearest and dearest friends. They are Peter and Andrew, two brothers, and James and John, two other brothers. They were fishermen for a living. And after calling them to follow him, Jesus says in verse 19, I will make you fishers of men. And if you've been around church for a long time, you're probably singing another song in your head just now. Jesus took that which they already knew, that idea of being fishermen, and showed them how he could use that in his purpose for his kingdom. He didn't say, come and follow me, but first go and do four years at Bible college and train up on how to um, become my follower. I'm not saying go to Bible college is a bad thing, but in order to be a follower of Jesus, you don't need to do that. When Jesus calls us as Christians, he calls us who we are and where we're at. He calls us to do specific tasks, often using the gifts that he's already given us before he calls us. Sometimes he uses new gift, gives us new gifts. What gifts has God given you? What things are you good at? What do you do for a living? What is your job? What do you enjoy doing? How could you use that for God's kingdom? How could you do the will on, of God on earth as it is in heaven? All four of these men left their nets as fishermen and followed Jesus. They were going to catch people. They were going to catch but catch people instead of fish from now on. And look at how they did it. We're told they did it both times immediately. Now there's a contrast later on in the Gospels of a man who delayed leaving his old life and following Jesus. There's another story of a man who refused to follow Jesus because he didn't want to leave his old life. And so if Jesus is calling you today, whether that's in salvation or service, is there anything in your life that is hindering you or delaying you in responding to Jesus? When Jesus calls us, we must forsake our own way and turn to his way immediately. So what was Jesus' ministry? Well, it was threefold. We're told here that it was preaching, teaching and healing. So let's look at teaching first of all. Teaching, it addresses the mind. In Jesus' day, the place, the place, of, teaching, um, the place of teaching was the local synagogues. Wherever the Jews settled, they established a synagogue. It was similar to our churches today. They would gather together, they would sing songs, they would pray, and they would listen to teaching. However, the teaching was a little bit different. In the synagogue, anybody could speak, anybody could bring any teaching. It might be new, it might be old, but whatever it was, you could bring it. And it was controlled by the leader of the synagogue, but very often or not, it was controlled by the majority of the crowd. So to that end, Jesus taught in the synagogues. It was the open forum to bring new ideas. And so Jesus spoke about the kingdom of heaven. He often used prophecies, prophecies that the Jews knew from the Old Testament to help aid his teaching. For us today, we have one true source of teaching. We have the Bible. You can go to many different churches today and listen to many different preachers. But the fact of the matter is, if you don't look at what is, if it doesn't match what is recorded in the Bible, then it is not true teaching. The Bible, it's a book of information to inform our minds of God's big plan through Christ. So we need to read it. We need to hear it explained that we might know Christ. But it's not just a book about information. It's a book about transformation. And that brings us on to the preaching part of Jesus' ministry. Because whereas teaching addresses the mind, preaching addresses the heart. You can accumulate knowledge. You don't even have to like 
what you know or accept it as true. But the fact of the matter is, when you preach, it appeals to the heart. In Jesus' day, the place of dealing with the heart was the temple in Jerusalem. One place to go. Many synagogues, but one temple. If you wanted to get your heart right before God, then you had to go to the temple. You had to speak to the priest. You had to offer an animal sacrifice. So Jesus was ushering in a new era in dealing with the heart. He preached, or as the text says, he proclaimed the kingdom of heaven. Verse 23. So here's the connection between John's message and Jesus' message. John preached repentance. Jesus preached the kingdom of heaven. And the transition point between the two is what goes on in the heart. Repentance is a change of heart that leads to a change of mind that leads to a change in actions. Teaching ends in knowing something, but preaching ends in doing something. Not just doing it out of duty, but doing it out of love and desire. And that's something that has to be done in the heart. But you see, there's a problem. Because the heart is broken by sin. And this brings us on to the final part of Jesus' ministry mentioned here. Healing. Healing addresses the body. And the reason why our bodies suffer today, the reason why eventually we will die, is connected to sin. Not sin actions. You're not going to die because you've done so many actions. Although you might get sick or you might have consequences and suffer because of your sinful actions. But what we're talking about here is humanity's proclivity to reject God, that sin nature that we're born with. And so suffering exists because sin exists. The message of the Bible is that God is pursuing a sinful humanity to redeem and restore them to the, redeem and restore them to the one that He created. Spiritually speaking, He does this through Jesus. Isaiah says that it is by His wounds, by Jesus' wounds, which He obtained on the cross, that we are healed. To that end, Jesus taught about the spiritual through the physical. And so in healing the body, he was saying physically, this is not the way it's meant to be. And that there will be one day in God's eternal kingdom where it won't be like this. But he was also saying, as I have power to heal your body, your suffering, the fact that you're going to die, so I have power to heal your heart your sin, and bring you into an eternal life. God says through the prophet Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. So when you trust in the Bible, when you trust in God, the Bible says that you are born again with a new heart. One that allows you to choose not to sin. One that allows you to choose God's values the values in God's kingdom. So Jesus' healing ministry, it was there to demonstrate what went on on the inside, not just the outside. Sadly, it was abused by the people of his day. People followed him simply because they liked him as healer. And sadly today, Christians are only interested in the healing ministries of the church. People were were following them for what they could get rather than what Christ could give. They're not interested to hear about the heart. They're only interested on the outside. You cannot follow Jesus for his healing ministry. In the same way, you can't take one aspect of his character and reject others. You need the preaching and teaching as well as the healing. It's a package deal. You need to look at Christ's love as well as his judgment because the two came together at the cross. God wants to heal your heart so that he can give you a new one that desires to know him and have a long and lasting relationship with him and his eternal kingdom. That's the message of the Bible and that is the ministry of Jesus. 
and we'll see that unfold in the coming weeks. Thanks very much for joining with us this morning. It's been great to have you. As always, please do get in touch if you have any questions or comments. The email address is pastor at plainsevangelicalchurch.com or you can phone me on my mobile number or send me a text 07702 701 806. I'd love to have a chat with you uh, during this time of lockdown if you'd like to discuss anything that we've looked at this morning. In addition to that, if there's anything we can do for you as a church, uh, we'd like to help you um, if you're not able to get out of the house. Uh, so please do get in touch or if you'd like a Bible, we'd like to get one to you. Uh, but it'd be great to have you back next week as we continue looking at the preaching ministry of Jesus and what he has to teach us. Have a great week, stay safe, and we'll see you next week.